How good are you at aviation trivia about airliners? Well, let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. If you're into airliners, you're going to enjoy this. We have a lot of interesting information. And even if you're not an airliner enthusiast, uh, make sure you watch this. You're going to learn a lot of interesting stuff about the industry. So if you haven't played before, here's how it works. We give you a statement like this one. The external difference between turbojets and the first turbofans were the larger cowlings forward of the core engine. And we're going to ask, is that true or false? Well, in this case, the answer is true. And then we'll show you a photo like this or like this, illustrating the answer. Well, are you ready? Let's play. The term meatball on an airliner refers to the dinner entree in first class. Nice try, but that's false. The meatball is the circular logo of an airline, like this one for Pan Am, this for Eastern, and this on the tail for Continental. To de-ice the windshields on early model Lockheed Constellations, Pilots lit alcohol on fire in the cockpit. Sure, but that's true. On the early model Connies, like this uh, 749 that you see here, the cockpits were configured like so. And if you look at the top of the photo, you'll see two pans that are covered with cheesecloth. And uh, those contain alcohol. They're basically sterno stoves, and they light the inside of the windshield panes uh, for icing. The Wright brothers' first flight in 1903 could have been made within the economy section of a Boeing 787-8 Dreamliner. That's true. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers' first flight of the Wright Flyer covered a distance of 120 feet. That's approximately the distance from the rear door to the L or R2 door under the word United that you see here. And that's the coach section of the airplane. The overall length of the 787-8 is 187 feet. De Havilland's Comet 1 was the world's first jet airliner. The second jet airliner to fly was the Boeing Model 367-80 prototype jet transport. That's false. The Comet first flew July 27, 1949. And the, the 707, oh, now, come on, you didn't think I was going to do a video without a model box stop. I have a better photo of the airplane. There you go. The uh, 707 prototype uh, flew July 15th, 1954. And I need to clarify this. I've had comments. This was not a Boeing 707. It was the predecessor, a uh, smaller airplane, a lot of different features. Uh, but this went on to become the basis for the KC-135 Stratotanker and the 707 airliner. Uh, several years later. This is the second jetliner to fly only two weeks after the comet. The Avro jetliner in Canada flew on August 10th, 1949. It never went into production. A TWA Lockheed Constellation once remained airborne for nearly 24 hours. And this is true. On October 2nd, 1957, a 1649 Jetstream constellation like this one flew from London, England to San Francisco, operating as TWA Flight 801, the inaugural nonstop passenger service from Europe to the west coast of the United States via the North Pole. This is the actual airplane that made the record-setting flight, which took an unbelievable 23 hours and 19 minutes due to unexpected and formidable headwinds. Amazingly, the same relief crew that finished the flight to SFO took the airplane on its final destination in Los Angeles. Engines on first-generation jetliners made black smoke taking off because they had afterburners for more power. That's false. They sure made black smoke on takeoff. It was really dramatic. But the reason is that they injected distilled water into the burner cans of the J-57 or JT-3 turbojets and that created the smoke that you'd see on takeoff. Everybody thought it was really cool because these were the new jets. But when turbofan engines came in, uh, there was no more need for water injection. They had more power to begin with. 
United Airlines offered men-only service on flights between New York and Chicago. Men only? It's true. Beginning in the late 1950s with Douglas DC-6Bs and running through the 1960s with Sud Caravels, United operated an exclusive executive service between New York's Idlewild and later JFK Airport and Chicago's O'Hare International. Airplanes departed from both cities at 9 in the morning and 5 at night, allowing same-day travel for businessmen. The caravel in this photo is an executive flight awaiting its passengers at JFK, who will board via the rear air stair since this aircraft was too low for the jetways to reach. The flight attendant was the only female on board, and yes, they actually did hand out cigars to the passengers. My, how times have changed. For steeper descents without increasing airspeed, Douglas DC-7s could lower their main landing gear only. And that is true. This was uh, an effective form of a speed brake. Uh, you see the airplane here. This is a Photoshop rendition, but it's configured for landing with the main gear out. And this was used to best advantage in the late 60s and, I'm sorry, the late 1950s and early 1960s uh, to integrate the prop liners with the faster jet traffic in and around the airports. It was essential that these airplanes could uh, merge into the traffic flow uh, without impinging on the speeds of the jet. Elvis Presley bought a Convert 880 to fly from Graceland to his shows in Las Vegas. This is a well-known fact. It's true. If you saw the movie, you saw the actual airplane. Called the aristocrat of the jets when first introduced in 1960, the Convert 880 was the fastest and, in my opinion, the most beautiful jetliner in the sky especially in the Delta Golden Crown color scheme seen here. But this airplane, November 8809er Echo, was delivered to the airline on October 22, 1960, and flew in service until 1973. In April 1975, Elvis purchased this 880 for $250,000 and then spent another $600,000 on a custom interior that included a queen-size bed, and a hi-fi stereo system with 52 speakers located throughout the jet. Named for his daughter, Lisa Marie, this 880 and Elvis's smaller Lockheed Jetstar are displayed right across the street from the Graceland Mansion in Memphis, Tennessee. If you're ever out in that part of the country, it's really worth the trip. The only airline to fly every type of Douglas and McDonnell Douglas airplane airliner, I should say, was Pan American World Airways. And that's false. It was KLM. And I should qualify that every type of production Douglas and McDonnell Douglas airliner, starting with the DC-2 seen here. And KLM was the only airline to fly the DC-5, which gives it the distinction of having flown the first production and last production uh, airliner built by Douglas and McDonnell Douglas. Now, I know I'm going to get flack. You're going to say, what about the 717? And believe it or not, that is a Boeing airplane. It was built after Boeing took over the company in 1997. But the MD-11 and KLM markings made the last passenger flight, essentially, of a Douglas slash McDonnell Douglas airliner. TWA was the first airline to have its markings on a rocket ship. Really? That's true. Here's the timetable. If you remember those for TWA in 1955 when Disneyland first opened. You know what? Let's go out and take a look. We just landed at LAX in our United DC 6, and uh, let's hop aboard this Los Angeles Airways S 55 and zip out to Anaheim uh, on a Friday afternoon in rush hour traffic. That would be about a two hour drive in the helicopter, 18 minutes. So here we are at uh, the heliport at Tomorrowland at Disneyland. And there in the background is the TWA moon rocket. This is actually a ride at Disneyland. You didn't go inside the rocket itself, but you went into the building and then it simulated a flight to the moon with uh, G loads and the, the sounds of the rocket. And you could go to the moon and back in about, oh, 20 minutes. In 1969, the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey featured the Pan Am space liner seen here leaving the, space, leaving the space station in this beautiful painting by Bob McCall. The Boeing 747 was the world's first double-deck airliner. Well, it wasn't. And I've taken flack on this one, so let's talk about it. 
The first all double deck, meaning nose to tail aircraft, was the consolidated and later Convair XC-99 transport, first flew in November of 1947. The Saunders Row Princess flying boat, uh, again, nose to tail double deck, uh, first flew in August of 1952, but never went into service. So that leaves the Boeing Stratocruiser which flew in July of 1947 and is the world's first double deck airliner. You see the three windows after the wing, and that was a lower deck lounge. You'd have a spiral staircase, a uh, predecessor of the spiral staircase in the 747. But this uh, gave passengers an exclusive uh, way of luxury travel, had a bar, and you could uh, go down to the lounge and hang out. Pretty neat. Concord passengers flying transatlantic westbound from Europe actually landed in New York before they took off? That's true. If you left London's Heathrow Airport at one in the afternoon, you would arrive at New York's JFK at 11 in the morning. The airplane actually outraced the Earth's rotation. The first scheduled sleeper service in the US was flown by a Douglas DC-3 in 1936. No, that's not so. Although the DC-3 DC did indeed feature sleeper service, it was originally called the DST, Douglas Sleeper Transport, that honor goes to the Curtis Condor, when in American Airlines was called the convertible sleeper plane, seen here in this cutaway. Speaking of American, in 1968, that airline saved more than $40,000 in fuel costs by removing one olive from the salads in first class. Oh, you have to be kidding. But it's true. This is the Astrojet era under the leadership of Bob Crandall, affectionately referred to as Fang. And uh, Crandall was adamant about cost saving. And that one little olive in every salad in first class over a year's time saved $40,000 in fuel. The Art Deco Spire atop the Empire State Building in New York was designed as a docking terminal for passenger zeppelins. That's absolutely true. The Graf Zeppelin had already traveled around the world by the late 1920s, had made scheduled passenger flights across the Atlantic. Here we see it uh, moored and, gosh, what an interesting aircraft. But the Empire State Building, which opened in 1931, was designed as a docking station for the Graf and other uh, Zeppelins that were intended to be built in Germany for passenger service around the world. Now, I have a question for you. The Empire State Building, from the ground to the top of the spire, is 1,250 feet tall. The Graf Zeppelin was 775 feet long. Does this look in scale to you? Looks a little, the Zeppelin looks a little small to me, but I'll leave that up to you. The first jetliner with three rear-mounted engines was the Boeing 727. That's false. The 727, model 100 seen here, first flew in 1963. But this airplane, the de Havilland and later Hawker Sidley Trident, flew in 1961 and became the first airplane to be qualified for Cat 3 operation. There are certain photos that just really evoke a feeling of flight. This is certainly one of them. What an elegant and beautiful looking airplane. Concorde flew scheduled passenger service within the United States. Well, how would that be possible? It made a sonic boom. Well, that's true. And it was Braniff that operated an interline service from Washington, D.C. to Dallas, Texas, and back, with the airplane then continuing on to Europe, either Paris or London. However, it never appeared in these markings, much to my chagrin. I took Braniff Flight 53 from uh, Washington, Dulles to Dallas-Fort Worth on April 16, 1979. One-way fare, $175. Let's climb aboard. I'll show you what it was like. Here we are getting off the mobile lounge, uh, which takes you out to the airplane at Dulles and had a nice shot of the nose. Inside, the airplane is uh, a bit small. And what was really amazing to me on this flight is that I'd say probably half the people, maybe even more, 70% uh, of the passengers on board, full load of 100 seats, um, had no idea what kind of airplane we were in. They were just on a brand of flight to Texas. And I heard comments like, Gosh, it's so small, and the windows are small, and it's loud, and what kind of plane is this? But here's the secret. The airplane flew at Mach 0.95. That's about 650 miles an hour. 
And that's how it uh, flew across country. I asked the captain when I got off, I said, what was it like flying at that speed? He said, flying at that speed in this airplane is like driving a Ferrari on the freeway in first gear. Here it is in Dallas, and now you can see why they call the airplane the beast. In 1952, Capital Airlines flew unpressurized World War II surplus Douglas DC-4s, which had oval windows. For marketing, the airline painted fake square windows around them to make passengers think they were on a more modern, pressurized DC-6. Really? Yes, it's true. Here's a DC-4 with the oval windows. Here's a DC-6 with the square windows, rounded corners, of course. And here's a Capital Airlines DC-4 with round windows and window frames of a DC-6 painted around them. Gotta love it. And if we need it, here's a tiebreaker. You ready? The first airline to fly jets in scheduled service in the U.S. was American Airlines with a Boeing 707 on January 25th, 1959. That's false. Re well, wait a minute. Here's the January 59 uh, issue of Flying Magazine. It had the airplane on the cover. Uh, it was a lot of publicity for that flight. But the answer is National Airlines, and it wasn't in this DC-8. That came about a year later. National Airlines operated jet service from New York to Miami in this exact airplane, the original Pan Am 707-120 uh, series. And how this worked is that Pan Am would fly an airplane from London or Paris into New York in the morning. National would then wet lease the airplane, flying a load of passengers from New York to Miami and back. And again, this was December of 1958, actually, uh, one month before Americans started service. And then once the airplane came back to Idlewild, Pan Am would take it back to Europe that evening. So there you have it. A look at some airline trivia. How did you do? I bet you got most of them right. But thanks for playing, and thanks for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. We appreciate your watching. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board. Please hit the like button on the way out. That does help us with YouTube. And as always, until next time, take care.